Good evening. Welcome to PEG's Fireside Chats with Candidates. I'm Joyce Short, and my co-host is Ellen Pollaby. We're joined this evening by our guest, Julie Menon, who was a candidate for New York City's City Council. Uh, Julie is a mom and a Yorkville resident. She's been the uh, Commissioner for Consumer Affairs for New York City, as well as the commi uh, Commissioner for Media and Entertainment. Also, she's been the Director of New York City's Census. Julie is a lawyer and an adjunct professor at Columbia University. So welcome, Julie. Uh, thanks for joining us today. And we're joining a meeting already in progress. Now, one of the main functions of the City Council is to have oversight of city agencies. I have sat through so many hearings on oversight, and quite honestly, I think who better than myself as a three-time commissioner to have oversight? And that's why when people say to me, well, if, you know, if, if you're in the council, what committee would you like to chair? And of course, I always say oversight and investigations, because that to me is a lawyer and as someone who, you know, Consumer Affairs is a prosecutorial agency. We had over 400 staff members, a huge investigative team, enormous legal team, but it is a prosecutorial agency. So the idea of the Oversight and Investigations Committee, where we can make sure that these city agencies are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing, that to me is something I'm incredibly interested and passionate about and something I really want to do. So that's um, th that. That's really why I'm running for council. You know, so many people in the community approach me about running for this seat. I was very busy running the census, and so you know, I, and obviously, you know, I couldn't enter this race until the census was done. So I'm really proud of the fact that I entered on December first, and we have so much support in this race. And that's, I think, is a testament because people want someone who is going to deliver results for the community in, in this crisis. And it's gonna be, you know, it, it, it's a difficult enough learning curve to be in the council in the first place, but when you overlay the crisis on top of it, I do believe experience matters. And someone like myself who is intimately uh, familiar with the workings of city government, um, I think that's honestly what's needed and why you see I'm getting the traction that I'm getting in this race. Excellent. Uh, I just want to interject one thing before you go on, uh, Ellen, and that's, uh, folks, if you do have questions that Ellen has not covered with Julie, uh, we'll try to get to them. Uh, if you want to place them in the chat, uh, we'll try to get to them before the, uh, before the episode ends. I don't know if we're going to be able to do it. This I don't time. know, but we'll try. We have, we have a whole lot of, I've left, I've left 15 minutes for Roosevelt Island questions. And we really okay. We've got some big ones. Um, okay, I'm ready. We've got a lot, we've got a lot of Upper East Siders on here too, so we have to okay. be considering. Uh, no, that's great. Right. Look, it's a big district. Get to the Roosevelt Island issues. Uh, I, I, you have talked about wanting to improve upon ULERP, the ULERP process to change it. It really needs changing. Having gone through the Roosevelt Islanders, having gone through a big ULERP process, that's the land use process with Cornell, it right. took a full year um, and something needs to change. But what do you think that needs to change? I, I know you have a whole idea. About yeah, there's a lot that needs to change. So it really, in the seven years that I chaired board one, I saw time and time again, these projects would come before the community board and there's a different negotiation every single time. There's a different result with ULERP every single time and there are really no standards. So I wanna take school overcrowding as perhaps the starkest example. So when I chaired board one, there were all of these residents that were moving into the community and the city kept putting forward these projects through ULERP to build more and more and add more residents to the community. Well, what about school overcrowding? We said to the Department of City Planning, well, how many students are you adding to these schools? These schools have no art room. They have no computer room. These kids are eating lunch at 10, 20 in the morning. You've got 36 kids in a class and you're going to, like, when is enough enough? This is unacceptable, you know, completely across the board. And so we did our own population studies to basically refute city planning. But no community board should have to do their own population studies. That is not the job of the community board, but it's because of a lack of comprehensive planning. So school, how many students is a project going to add to the local schools has to be a germane question, and it's not in our planning. 
what is happening to transit? How will that project affect transit? What happens in terms of open space? What happens in terms of hospital capacities? Cities all across the US have something called comprehensive planning. It's logical, it makes sense. We don't have it in New York and it's absurd. And honestly, it has to change. And I do wanna say, Speaker Johnson has introduced a sense of comprehensive planning. You know, I've gone through it and I think, obviously we wanna have comprehensive planning. So there are parts in there that, you know, that, that make sense with comprehensive planning. But my concern, honestly, with that proposal is I believe it will take power away from the community boards. And that's not something that I can support. I'm a community board person. I believe in community boards. I believe in the most hyper-local form of government having input. And I worry with that particular proposal, and look, a lot of details need to be worked out there, but my concern and really looking at, at that is what is gonna happen to community boards? What is their role really gonna be in the process? And I would worry that power may and voice may be an agency may be taken away from community boards. So that is my concern with that particular project. But with that said, we can absolutely do comprehensive planning. I used to be on the board of the Municipal Arts Society. And for those that are not um, familiar with MAS, they do tremendous work around planning. And, you know, they've done a lot of the, the taken on a lot of the big planning issues in our city over many, many years. And we work there on this idea of comprehensive planning. Why can't we do a master plan by borough that really looks at everything? It should look at hospital capacity, open space, transit, affordable housing. It should look at all of these issues that we face as communities. It's not only District 5. This is an issue, honestly, that affects the whole city of New York and should be taken up by uh, the next administration. And certainly if I'm on the council, I'm gonna push for it because we, we need to have this. Are we gonna keep going down this road where we don't have comprehensive planning? It's just, it doesn't make sense. And, and at some point we need to stand up and say, we have there is a better way uh, and we have to do it a better way and actually think outside of the box and get this done once and for all. So I do, you know, definitely believe, believe that. Okay, so, so now since you wanna do it comprehensively around the whole city, um, you know, there, there are other parts of the city that sometimes need more than we need. So when, choose, when making a choice, and I'm going to read you this theory of donut economics. Ah, uh, okay. Which okay. I had, I, you, know, you know, which I meant, which I'd like to ask you about. So there's a theory, a concept of donut economics, where everyone in the environment thrives and we like to think that New York City as a metropolitan center can be a thriving community all over the city. The essential question making, what, making any decision large or small, including purchasing, uh, is how can our city be a home to thriving people in a thriving planet while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? Which means that purchasing, for instance, is not going to include a um, some place that practices slavery, modern slavery, mm -hmm. um, or, or pollution, et cetera. So would you pledge to operate within this, with this in mind? Oh yeah, absolutely. We want a, a, a place where everyone is thriving and the environment thrives. A hundred percent, I agree with that. And just to be clear on comprehensive planning, I'm in no way suggesting that different communities are pitted against each other. We need a comprehensive plan for District 5. My only point in mentioning uh, other communities is that it's not only endemic to District 5. This is a problem that plagues other communities as well. We need a comprehensive plan once and for all for District 5. But in terms of the donut theory and what you're saying, yes, I mean, there's so much that we need to do. And it also, you know, when, when you talk about the environment thriving, it also gets into issues about sustainability and resiliency. I mean, I'm a huge uh, environmentalist, and it's something I really believe in. Um, in I was uh, responsible for helping leading the charge to build the city's first green school, PS 276, and it's now serves as a paradigm for actually how you build green in terms of building more public schools. I also did a, a tremendous amount of work after 9-11 on air quality, on retrofitting all the construction vehicles at ground zero with ultra low sulfur diesel fuel, 
Um, I received a award from the League of Conservation Voters for the work that I did in that regard. We need to do a lot more around resiliency, like how are we protecting against flooding, improving air quality, uh, reducing the urban heat island effect. We obviously need to plant more trees. We need to get rid of asphalt, replace it with native plants and absorbent surfaces. We need to create new green services. We have to beautify our streets. We've got to make them more resilient. Um, I, you know, I know on the East uh, River Esplanade, I mean, that's something again, and I use it all the time with my daughter. We walk there all the time. We need to fix that area once and for all. And on Roosevelt Island, there's so much we need to do, uh, particularly around resiliency. We learned with Sandy the hard way that if we're not prepared, our communities are going to be destroyed. And we have to focus more on resiliency and sustainability. So uh, there's just a, a lot of work that needs to be done. And I'm someone who, in you know, my track record of getting things done, I think is incredibly strong. And so on resiliency and on protecting the environment, you know, we need, are gonna need a champion to really push that forward. But I, I like your mentioning the donut theory, Ellen. I think it's really important. And so thank you for, for bringing that up. Thank you. Um, so um, there, there is a question I wanted to ask, so, and then somebody else brought it up, um, about balancing public safety and, um, and, and social justice. And, and just social justice, yes. Yeah, sure. So I, I've been speaking a lot about this because in speaking to residents all throughout the district, public safety is definitely top of mind. People are talking about public safety, they're concerned about public safety, and we need to address it. At the same time, you can have criminal justice reform. I, I just believe it is a false choice to say that you cannot have both. Um, I've served on the Reform Council of the Vera Institute, which is a criminal justice organization. We've done some really important work around criminal justice reform, um, focused on the chokehold ban, focus on you know, having a national registry for police disciplinary records and things of that nature. But on public safety, you know, we need to make sure that our NYPD is focused on fighting crime. And I personally believe one of the best ways to do that is to let them do that, let them do that part of the job. Right now, almost 40% of calls to 911 are actually focused on mental health and homelessness. So if we can pull some of those areas out of the NYPD and have the NYPD focused on crime, uh, that I think would honestly improve public safety. And then lastly, I would say, and I had a senior role at the city law department while I was serving as census director, um, we have a situation where the city is spending over $200 million a year settling NYPD lawsuits. Why? Why are we spending that money? We should obviously not have that as an issue and we should be reinvesting that money into important social services. So I'm, I'm a huge proponent of we can absolutely improve our public safety and we need to. And we can have criminal justice reform. We can actually do both and it is possible. Um, so that's my personal opinion on the matter. Okay, great, great. Um, so that, that's just a touch. I'd love to ask you more about that, but we have to move into Roosevelt Island questions. Um, okay. you, had, you had talked to me about, a, about the, Roosevelt Island needing a storm surge barriers and mm -hmm. The city has had about five years ago talked about a a, ber a berm putting mm -hmm. a berm up near Kohler Hospital, mm -hmm. and we don't know what happened to it. They talked about it; it was really important. We had plans; we saw all sorts of plans, and it disappeared. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea where this might be? Yeah, I mean, this is a problem, and this is why I will tell you that I know I can do a phenomenal job as your next council person, because you need someone who's gonna be tenacious, who knows these different agencies, and who's gonna go in there and you know really shake things up and get things done. Um, obviously, in this situation, the city had obtained a $1.6 billion, I believe, commitment from FEMA to repair and restore hospitals that are operated by HHC or Health and Hospitals Corporation that were damaged during Hurricane Sandy like Kohler and they and, and allocate funding uh, to protect them with a berm. And so I am aware that REAC and the city entered into a memorandum of understanding to do that and the city's conducting a feasibility study. But then after that, 
you know, things sort of fell apart. And so I do think you need someone coming in there really strong who understands these city agencies and is going to hold them accountable. Um, you know, the New York's, and, you, and by the way, you also have too many entities involved. I've seen this problem happen so many times. You've also got the Office of Resilience and Recovery for the city and the New York City Emergency Management are also designing flood protection. So you've got like a myriad different agencies all working on things. And so often when this happens, things are siloed. I see this happen all the time. And that is honestly where the elected official comes in because it's elected official's job to then go in and hold the agency's feet to the fire. They made commitments, it's not happening, and you all are losing out in the process unacceptable. So I, you know, I can tell you for certain that if I'm involved, I'm going to get to the bottom of this because it, it, none of this should be happening. But again, I think, and it's one of the challenges, obviously, with Roosevelt Island, with REAC, that you've got a situation where you've got the city, you've got the state. And by the way, we had the same thing when I chair community board one with Battery Park City. I had to deal with the Battery Park City Authority, totally controlled by the state. And we held their feet to the fire to make sure that residents' demands were being met. It didn't matter that it is a state agency. It still serves the, the people, you know? And so I think in this situation, there are a lot of parallels, um, although there's some differences, but there's, there are a number of parallels there. And I definitely have the experience to be able to get to the bottom of these issues because your needs are not being met and that is not okay. Uh, Patricia asked a question that's Roosevelt Island centric on the uh, chat. So let me ask, uh, interject this one. Uh, Roosevelt Island uh, is being, uh, Roosevelt Islanders are being priced out, mm -hmm. uh, particularly seniors and people that are disabled. Uh, so what can you do to protect affordable housing on Roosevelt Island? Yeah, I mean, this is an, and Patricia, thank you so much for asking the question. It is so important because you're absolutely right. There is an affordability crisis on Roosevelt Island that, and other areas that absolutely has to be addressed. And so part of it is having the city step up and provide more assistance. Right now we have the federal stimulus bill. So the city is getting this additional funding based on the work that I did on the census we are actually getting more money for affordable housing than um, our proportionate share versus other cities because we did a great job on the census, honestly, and we're getting good response on that. But we need to make sure then that the city is, is allocating this money for rental assistance. Um, it, it, it has to happen. And right now, my concern would be that you know, we have to make a deep level commitment to keep affordability on Roosevelt Island. And so you have my commitment on that. It's also a question of ensuring that all of the agencies that are dealing with affordable housing and there are a number, HPD being one of the leading ones, are really living up to the commitments that they need to do. So it's approaching it in, in that different way. And, and, and it just has to happen because you just can't have a situation where people are leaving. I also, by the way, would push to create a new security deposit guarantee program because the research has shown that affording the security deposit is actually one of the biggest barriers um, for low income New Yorkers. So that is obviously has to do with people who are coming in. Uh, but I think that that is, a, you know, something that also makes a, a difference as well. I'm glad you brought up the uh, issue of security deposits. What do we have to do to restore the interest payments on security deposits that are being gro grossly overlooked by our landlords? Right, now that is another issue as well. And it, it can absolutely be addressed, you know, legislatively. It's, it's very, very important to do. When I was Commissioner of Consumer Affairs, we did so many joint um, investigations, both uh, with the New York Attorney General's office um, on that. And so, it, yes, but it can also, there's a legislative fix that can happen as well. Good, you know, one thing that um, it concerns me in particular is that we actually don't have representative government here on Roosevelt Island. Uh, the people that run the community are appointed. Uh, and even though we've had referendums determining who the mm -hmm. community wants and doesn't want on the REAC board, uh, mm -hmm. the governor has the prerogative to mm -hmm. just look the other way, mm -hmm. not address it. Uh, he's left some of our uh, positions open for many, many years without filling them. 
Uh, currently, I believe that they're all filled. I, I could be wrong on that. I, I didn't check before this, uh, this episode. But what is it that we can do and how can you help us in order to actually get representative government and make sure that, the, that REOC actually has to listen to the community and be guided by the community's interests? A hundred percent. We had the same problem with Battery Park City, where in, initially there weren't residents serving on the authority board, and we were able to turn that around. First, it's about representation. It's about making sure that the residents, you know, to your point, Joyce, have enough representation on the board. Secondly, it's about REAC actually meeting with the community on a regular, dedicated basis. So I I, you know, I, I've dealt with this issue before. It happened at the Battery Park City Authority where they'd have a meeting and then people could come in during the public session. No, that's not enough. You actually have to have much more frequent uh, residential input because look, at the end of the day, they're there to serve you, not vice versa. And so it's, it's reminding them of that. I also have obviously very strong relationships at both the state, the city, level. And so at the state level, it's it's pressure points. It's ensuring that you're represented and that you're getting residential, true residential representation, um, you know, on, on the board. And that, that has to happen. So there are many different ways to approach the issue, but having gone through it once before, um, we were successful in getting residential representation. It's about being loud. It's about being forceful. It's about being tenacious. And it's also quite honestly about having the relationships at a very, not at a junior level, at a very, very senior level, which I do, because that is what you need to really push that ball forward and actually make it happen. Uh, but you do need more representation. And, and, and I just feel like, you know, whether it's permitting issues, whether it's um, on public safety, it, it making sure that Roosevelt Island is really truly being represented. And, and so I would be so excited to be able to take on those issues with you. And I am absolutely confident that we could have success on them. You know, every year we put, the community board puts uh, or sea walls into the budget and we've never gotten the money from the city. Same thing with a lot of different uh, requests in, into the city. We, we pay taxes into the city and we didn't get nothing in return. Generally, right. everything we get comes from the state, if we get it from the state. Um, and so as your, as our representative, would you fight for our, you know, in the budget for things for Roosevelt Island? How, how, would, how would that happen? A hundred percent. I mean, I think that, you know, I'm known as someone, if you talk to people who have worked with me, I mean, I won't back down from a fight. And I'm also very involved in like how you get from point A to point B and actually secure a win. So I think on this budgeting issue, it, it, it involves relationships, uh, which I have. And right now, you know, all the different candidates in the city council that are running for speaker are all people that I worked with as commissioner and pride myself on having incredibly strong relationships. It's why I am the um, only candidate in the race that's actually been endorsed by other city council members. I've been endorsed by city council member Carlina Rivera and city councilwoman Diana Ayala. And, you know, I think that that really matters because we, we are going to have a new speaker and I feel someone like myself who has, you know, tremendous experience, you know, will be in a very strong position uh, to try to negotiate the best possible result for Council District 5. And that's what you should want. And so I, I totally understand your frustration because there's nothing worse than you pass a resolution at community board and then absolutely nothing happens. That, and, and that is, again, where you need incredibly forceful, incredibly strong and very experienced leadership uh, to actually get something, uh, get a different result. Um, so that, I mean, this is why I'm running. I'm really excited about the possibility of taking on these issues and delivering on them. So we're coming up to uh, 8.15. So Ellen, how about one more question? We got the participatory budgeting. How, we, wow. um, how would you handle the budget, your discretionary budget? Mm -hmm. I'm 100% committed to participatory budgeting. I think it's fantastic. Look, at the end of the day, things should not be top down. They should be bottom up. It should be your choices. 
uh, it should be your choices as to what is funded, not, in my opinion, what the council, what any particular council member thinks. That's what's so great about participatory budgeting is you're really getting so many different viewpoints about what do the communities that comprise the council district want. So I'm a big fan of participatory budgeting. I think, frankly, we can push it actually even further. Um, and I think it, it, it has to happen. I also want to say a word about the city budget because we are in a real deficit right now. And the mayor in the latest budget has said that every city agency has to cut 3.5% across the board. Now, obviously, with the federal stimulus dollars, that is a one-shot injection uh, that will solve some of those issues, but it's not a long-term panacea. So I'm saying that because once again, we're gonna to need to go into that budget and we're gonna to need to make you know, tough choices. I, I believe personally that there's some areas of the budget that were cut last time like sanitation that never should have been cut. The last year's council budget cut over a hundred million dollars of sanitation, over 400 workers. I have the sanitation union endorsement. Why? Because I've stood up time and time again to sanitation cuts. You know, people say to me, oh, I see garbage. Uh, overflowing in the streets. Well, yeah, of course you do, because they cut the sanitation budget. And by the way, they cut the budget on composting and recycling too, which I think needs to be restored. I really believe in composting and recycling. So we need to get that back into the budget. But it's going to take someone with experience to honestly get these things done. Where I would cut, and I've been saying this, you know, throughout for a long time, and while I've been running in this race, I believe very strongly that Thrive, it's a $1.2 billion program, and there are a lot of parts of Thrive that simply do not have the data metrics to support it. And we need to go in there and make some tough choices on Thrive and cut the parts of Thrive that simply are not working and reinvest it into other important social services that absolutely do work. Um, so those are a few of the different ways that I would approach the budget. But I love the budget process. It's, it's not everyone loves it, I'll say, but I do because it's, 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 it's about trying to get the best resources that we possibly can for our community. And I think that that is something that I have a particularly unique skill set at being able to deliver. So I'd like to end on a note from, uh, from the Upper East Side uh, before we go. And uh, it's from a fellow by the name of Aura. I, I don't know, a man or woman, I, I really don't know. Interesting name. Um, how does your experience in the recovery of downtown inform your plans for the recovery of the Upper East Side and the city from the economic impact of COVID? Well, thank you for that question. So that is incredibly important. So look, after 9-11, we were in a crisis uh, that our city had never faced before. And I was intimately involved in the rebuilding, not only of Lower Manhattan, but of our city after 9-11. I also served on the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation Board. We allocated over $3 billion uh, to everything from fixing up the Esplanade, to fixing up Hudson River Park, to building out Pier 26, all these really important waterfront projects projects that um, I, I believe were incredibly important, uh, both for uh, open park space and resiliency. But it's that level of experience of dealing with a crisis. 9-11 was a terrible crisis for our city. Now we once again are in a crisis, a very, very different type of crisis, but we're in a health crisis. Um, we're in an economic crisis. We're in a justice crisis. We have all of these different crises convening at exactly the same time for our city. There are gonna be 35 open seats on the council out of 51 seats. Two thirds of the council is about to turn over. And this is why I made this decision to run. I have years of experience in dealing with so many different city issues and we need experience now to get us out of this crisis. So I do believe very strongly that my experience after 9-11, it obviously um, was very important to me, the work I did after 9-11, but that kind of work, again, is crisis work when you're dealing with hundreds and hundreds of small businesses in the neighborhood closing. You're dealing with residents, you're dealing with 
health issues after 9-11. We had so many issues that we had to deal with. And now once again, our city's in crisis and I'm running because I want to play a part in the city's recovery. I love the city. I think we li live in the greatest city in the world, but we're in a crisis and we're at a crossroads. And I think the question that voters have is what direction do you want our community to go in? Who do you trust and feel is the strongest person to represent you who is actually gonna get things done on the issues that you deeply and fundamentally care about? Um, so I'm so thrilled to be running and you know, really thank you for these incredible questions. I do wanna say if anyone didn't um, get the opportunity to ask a question and wants to email me, my email is julie for nyc at gmail.com and four is spelled out. So that's J-U-L-I-E-F-O-R-N-Y-C at gmail.com. Or if you wanna to go to my website, it's the same thing, it's julieforNYC.com. And there's a lot of information there that we didn't get to cover tonight, but a ton of information there. And please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have any questions. Julie, thank you just so much for, uh, for being with us this evening and uh, giving us all this information, it's been wonderful. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you, Ellen, for putting together this fantastic forum. I so appreciate it. Our pleasure. Wanted to remind uh, all of our viewers that we'll be on again on uh, Monday night, uh, this coming Monday night, March the 22nd, uh, when our guest will be Rebecca Lamorte. And also I wanna remind you that your vote is your voice. So please make sure that your voice is heard loud and clear on March the 22nd. So folks, until next time, we're gonna put this torch out and we'll see you on March 22nd. Thanks for, thanks for being with us. Hi everyone, thank you so much.